We're going to be dealing with a very interesting subject, which is the subject of the kingdom of the cults and the difference between the kingdom of the cults and historic biblical Christianity. We're going to be looking at what does the word cult mean and what exalt exactly do we mean when we talk about the cults. When we talk about the cults, we are talking about, first of all, the word cult comes from the Latin word cultus, which means a group. It means a group which is gathered around an individual or an organization, and this group follows the interpretation of the leader. When we speak of a cult in Christian definitions and Christian terminology, we are referring to a group that rejects the essential teachings of historic Orthodox Christianity. In other words, a cult is a group that follows a leader and they claim to be in harmony with historic Christianity while in fact they deny all the essential teachings of the historic Christian faith. Now there is another branch also that is um, a deviant movement of Christianity which is known as the occult. And the word occult also comes from Latin and it means hidden, that which is hidden. And the world of the occult involves the belief in the tapping into and or communication with the supernatural, the mystical. And we find examples of this in the New Age movement and in Wicca and other forms. And so as Christians, we have to deal with two uh, basic movements. Number one, we have to deal with the world or the kingdom of the cults. And secondly, we have to deal with a group uh, or a movement that is known as the occult. Now bear in mind that the world of the occult is far more dangerous than the world of the cults. There are more people involved in the world of the occult simply for the reason that in the world of the occult people are in search of the unknown. They want to know their future. They want to know uh, who they're going to marry. They want to know what lies ahead. They want to know what does the future hold for them. And so those who are part of the occult uh, number by far those who are part of the world of the cults. So again, let me reiterate, the word cult comes from the Latin word cultus, which means a group. And in the Christian definition, if you look at a dictionary, you'll notice that there is a number of definitions for the word cult. There's a sociological definition, there's a psychological definition, but the, the Christian theological definition is a group which claims to be in harmony with the historic Christian faith, while in fact it denies all the essential teachings of historic Christianity. For example, the cults will all deny the doctrine of the Trinity. They will deny that God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All the cults will deny the deity of Christ. All the cults will deny salvation by grace alone. And so all the cults hold certain traits in common that are easily identifiable. Now we also have to ask the question, why are there so many cults in the world today? Why do they abound? Why do they exist? Well, the reason why so many cults exist today is simply for the reason that Christians on whole have not really been doing their jobs. They have not really been doing their work. And as a result of our neglect, counterfeit movements have evolved and have developed and have emerged in North American society, which now have become a major problem for the Christian church as a whole. For example, in the missionary field as we know today, most Christian missionaries have to deal with various groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and people in other cults. They have a difficult problem dealing with these people, how to deal with them, how to counter uh, attack what they claim and how to disprove their claims. And so the world of the cults proves to be a formidable foe 
and also at the same time, the world of the cults proves to be a challenge to the Christian church that we must indeed respond to. Now this brings us back again to the issues that I raised in the first lecture in the introduction to apologetics, and that is that the commission of the church is twofold. The commission of the church is first of all to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and secondly, it is to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must proclaim the gospel, but at the same time, we must defend it. Defend it against whom? Defend it against the critics, defend it against the cults, defend it against all those who will raise objections to it. Now, I'm going to uh, hearken back to a passage that we dealt with in our introduction, and that is the passage found in Jude 3, or Judas, or Judah, as he is better known. And in Jude 3, we are told again, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Now again here, uh, I call your attention to the fact that Jude or Judas reminds the church that this salvation that we share is something that we ought also to defend. And he urges us here to contend, to fight for the faith. And you notice he says here, that was once for all entrusted to the saints. In other words, God has entrusted the truth of the gospel to the church. God has entrusted or deposited that truth to our care. And it is the responsibility of the Christian church to protect that faith, to safeguard it, not only against the critics, but also against false teachers and false prophets and against all those who seek to come against it. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, which is another passage that we looked at in our introduction, Peter reminds us here as well, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I want you to notice again that Peter emphasizes that Christ must be set apart as Lord, primarily, first of all, in our hearts. Before we are able to give a ready answer or a ready defense, Christ must be Lord in our hearts, and then, and only then, will we be prepared. Notice Peter says here that we should always be prepared to give an answer. What this means is that the Christian should be in a position to provide answers to those who ask of us. Now, this passage does not mean that Christians should be uh, intellectuals in the sense of knowing everything, having an answer to every question. That's not what he's saying because only God is omniscient, only God is all-knowing. But he does tell us here that we should always be prepared, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks us about the, to give the reason for the hope that we have. But notice he says to do this with gentleness and respect. He doesn't say to go out and to chop their heads off. He doesn't say to go out and clobber them. But he says to do this with gentleness and respect. So what this passage is telling us is that the Christian church is in the business of answering questions. In fact, it has been in the business of answering questions for almost 2,000 years. And when we fail to give the answers to the questions that are being asked, unfortunately what happens is people veer off into other religions and people veer off into the world of the cults. And so, because God has given us the deposit of this faith, God has also given us the responsibility to always be ready to give an answer to those who ask of us the reason that we have. So, anytime you think that we are not supposed to give answers, remember 1 Peter 3.15. Now, Many people in the church have this idea that we should really not offend anybody. We have been plagued uh, in our society by the view of political correctness. 
We live in a society where it is not politically correct to say certain things, to think certain things, or to publish certain things. It is becoming politically incorrect in our society to uh, object to abnormal sexual behavior like that of homosexual behavior. It has become politically incorrect to uh, talk about the graphic reality of abortion, of the unborn. It has become politically incorrect to do many things. And the problem is that this sense of political incorrectness has, or political correctness, has infiltrated the church where Christians and pastors are afraid to say things that are controversial. They're afraid to say things that may stir up controversy because they feel that we as Christians must only be loving and we should not be hateful or we should not hate anything. We should just love, 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 love. And we assume that God somehow is some big love puffball in the heavens and that all God wants us to do is love. I'll never forget uh, as a young Christian and teaching my first class, uh, I will never forget the Sunday school director approached me once in front of the whole class and said to me, uh, Tony, I have one major objection against you. And I said, well, we're way ahead of the ball game. What is it now? She said, I have a major objection. And the objection is that if you criticize people all the time, you really aren't loving. And I said, really? She said, yes, you're not loving if you criticize people all the time. I said to her, who was the most loving person who ever lived? She said, oh, that's easy, Jesus. I said, Jesus, right? She said, yes, Jesus. I said, Jesus was incarnate love, wasn't he? He was love in the flesh. She said, yes, Jesus was love. Love, love in the flesh. And I said, listen to the voice of love. And so for the next couple of minutes, all I did was quoted scripture. And all I quoted was this. You generation of slimy snakes. Who has warned you of the damnation to come? Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire. You are of your father, the devil. And you follow after his works. Depart from me. I never knew you. I said, do you know who said that? She said, Jesus? I said, yes, Jesus said that. I said, that is the voice of love speaking. But you see, Jesus was not afraid to say it as it was. In fact, that is what had him, that is exactly what got him into trouble in the first place. That is exactly what got him killed. When Jesus came into the world, Jesus said it as it was. You do not give an aspirin pill to somebody who's dying of cancer. And so when Jesus came, Jesus did not say to the Pharisees, you know, we all are teaching the same truth. All roads lead to God. Why don't we just get along? And why don't we just, you know, do the best we can to live in harmony with each other? Of course, that is not the picture we have. John the Baptist himself, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus, was not a politically correct preacher. He came into the wilderness and he came preaching repentance, preparation for the kingdom of God. And when John the Baptist came, John the Baptist addressed the people and said, You brood of vipers, who has warned you of the damnation to come? He who comes after me. He will come and he will purge his barn. He will remove the chaff. He will place his wheat into the barn and he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so when John the Baptist, John the baptizer came, he did not come with a message of political correctness. He came with a message of judgment and of preparation for the kingdom of God. And so as Christians, you must also be aware of the fact that we must be prepared to face the opposition of those who oppose us and those who would charge us to be politically incorrect. Because to follow in the footsteps of the master is to do what the master himself commanded. 
Now, the idea that Christians must always love and not hate is purely unbiblical. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9, the Apostle Paul pointed out, pointed out love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. In other words, how will anyone know your position unless you speak against that which is in opposition to God's revelation? Jesus hated what was evil and he told his people the truth even though he knew that by telling them the truth he would be killed for it and he loved them enough to tell them the truth and he sacrificed his life for the truth. It's quite ironic that when Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, Pilate asked Jesus the question, what is truth? And you will notice in the gospel that Jesus remained silent. Here was Pilate staring at truth right in the face and he did not even know it. Jesus did not respond because he was the incarnate truth, the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said that everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And so the idea of offending people, we as Christians should realize that the gospel is in and of itself offensive. The truth hurts. The truth is offensive. And so if people hate you for telling them the truth, then you should rejoice on the fact that you are in good company because scripture tells us that all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now there are millions of people trapped in the world of the cults all over the world and those who are trapped in the world of the all cult surpass those who are trapped in the world of the cult. We have a massive, a huge mission field before us outside our doors outside the doors of this church building we have an incredible vast field of people who are lost and who need to hear the truth of the gospel 70 percent of people trapped in the world of the cults came out of the christian church that is a shock to many but it is a reality 70 percent of people in the cults came out of the Christian church. Why do they do this? This is in direct fulfillment of what we read about in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 19, where we are told, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Notice John points out here in his letter that one of the significant factors in deducing that they were in the last hour was the fact that many antichrists had come. Now, the Antichrist is still to come, that is for sure. He will be the final world dictator who will oppose Christ at his coming. But even now, that is in the first century, John is writing that many Antichrists have appeared. And he says, this is the reason why we know it is the last hour. Now, bear that in mind, because we, we will return to this. John points out here that these antichrists went out from us. That is, they went out from the church. Why? Because they did not really belong to us. If they had belonged to us, that is the church, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Now this is very significant because all of the major cults today, whether you're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Moonies, the Christian Science people, Unity School of Christianity, um, all of the major cult systems in the world today all came out of the Christian church. All of the leaders of these cults 
all started from within the nest of the Christian church, and then they went out from it. So please bear that in mind, that the majority of the cult systems in the world today left the fold of the Christian church. Now, Jesus himself warned about the coming of these movements that we see today. He warns us about these uh, movements, and he describes them in quite graphic detail. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 23, Jesus says this, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now you will notice here in this passage that Jesus uses two graphic details. He speaks of, first of all, sheep and wolves. He says that false prophets come to us in sheep's clothing, even though inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now this is very important, because what it shows immediately is that there is a sense of uh, deception that goes on here. False prophets come to us in sheep's clothing. But in reality, they are wolves. Now, why does Jesus mention sheep's clothing here? Well, because the sheep, or those who are sheep, are described in Scripture as the people of God. Throughout Scripture, God compares himself to a shepherd, and his people are the sheep of his pasture, or the sheep of his flock. Jesus in the New Testament, in like manner, also compares his disciples or his followers to sheep, as we see in John chapter 10, where he speaks of himself as the good shepherd and he calls his followers his sheep. Now, have you ever wondered why it is that Jesus always refers to his people as sheep? Why didn't Jesus say, for example, feed my giraffes or feed my whales or feed my dogs? Or why didn't Jesus say, feed my chimpanzees. Why did Jesus say, feed my sheep? Well, the answer is quite clear. God has chosen sheep, the dumbest critters on the face of the earth, to describe his people. His people are like sheep without a shepherd. They are lost without a shepherd. Not only that, but they are absolutely the dumbest creatures on the face of the earth. One sheep will run off a cliff and the whole flock will run after it. One sheep will stare a wolf in the eyes and do nothing while it is being attacked and devoured. Sheep are lost so much that if a shepherd does not bring a sheep to the proper pasture, a whole flock of sheep will starve itself to death. God has chosen the imagery of sheep to denote his people. And so, what do false prophets do? They come dressed like us, they sound like us, they talk like us, they use the same terminology you and I do, they look Christian, but in fact, they are not Christian. Notice Jesus speaks here also about fruit. You will recognize them by their fruit. Now, Jesus is not talking here about the fruit of life, like the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, love, etc. What he's talking about is the fruit of false prophets. What is the fruit of false prophets? According to the Bible, the fruit of false prophets is two things. Number one, it is false teaching. 
Number two, it is false prophecy. The fruit of a false prophet is number one, false teaching, and number two, false prophecy. And so he tells us to watch out for false prophets. He warns us about these false prophets. He tells us that they're going to come and they're going to sound like us. They're going to use our language. They're going to use our terminology. But in reality, they are really ferocious wolves who are disguised to look like us. And what do wolves do to sheep? Very simply, they destroy them, devour them, and have them for dinner. And so in the same way Jesus tells us the only way you can detect a false prophet is by analyzing their fruit. Do they teach in accord with sound doctrine? And if they proclaim something uh, as, as that of a prophecy, then we are to test it. If it does not come to pass, it is not something that the Lord has spoken. And so Jesus tells us that by their fruit we shall know them or recognize them. I want you also to notice that Jesus points out here that they will even call him Lord. That's why he points out, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. False prophets will give the name Lord to Jesus. But that does not guarantee their salvation. Because while they claim that he is the part here is that they deny his identity. They deny who he really is. I want you also to notice something else. He says that not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We must ask the question, well, well, what is the will of the Father? Well, that question is answered for us in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, where Jesus tells us the will of the Father is to believe on him whom he sent, and he will raise him on the last day. So the will of the Father is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we shall be saved. I want you also to notice that many will say to him on that day. Now that expression, that day, is a reference to the judgment. And they will say to him, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? Now we must be very, very careful here. Because many people today are of the persuasion that if someone performs signs or miracles, somehow that authenticates them. Somehow, if someone performs miracles and casts out demons in the name of Jesus, that means they belong to God and they follow Christ. Jesus is saying here, beware, watch out, because there will be false prophets who will be able to prophesy in my name, who will be able to drive out demons, and will be able to perform many miracles. We have examples of this in the world of the cults where people were actually healed. In the Mormon church, for example, in Christian science. Today, we hear of Christian science practitioners. I want you to notice something important here, that the emphasis here is not on the false prophets, but in the name. In other words, demons, and I know this personally, because my wife and I have been involved in exorcism, and we know quite well that demons respond to the authority of Christ's name. And you will notice that Jesus says here, we prophesied in your name, and in your name we drove out demons, and we performed many miracles. In other words, the power is latent, not in the person per se, but that the power is latent in the name of Christ. So it is no surprise that someone even like the Dalai Lama can come and exercise a demon in the name of Christ. Demons are authorized to respond to the name of Jesus. And so when someone casts out a demon or performs a miracle of some sort, they do so in the name of Christ. But that does not necessarily mean that the person is sent from Christ or God. And this is why Jesus says, beware, false prophets will also perform signs. And today, the people today are following after signs and wonders just like they did in the first century. You see, one of the things that really annoyed the Lord Jesus was the fact that people would follow him around for the express purpose of seeing a show. They wanted to see signs. They wanted to see miracles. 
And for that reason, Jesus would say, will you not believe unless you see signs and wonders? And when they ultimately had rejected him, Jesus said to them, no sign shall be given unto you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man. And Jesus said, the final sign will be this one, the resurrection. If you do not believe the resurrection, then you will never believe in my miracles, never believe in my signs. Does this mean that God does not perform signs and wonders? Well, of course he does. But what Jesus is warning us is that false prophets will come and false prophets will proclaim that they are performing signs and miracles in the name of Jesus. And what we find today is exactly that. People will say, well, uh, there are miracles. Uh, the blind are seen. Demons are being cast out. He must certainly be from God. And Christ is warning us quite the contrary here. Don't just follow them because of the signs. The signs are in his name, but that does not authenticate who they are. I want you to notice that Jesus will say to these people, I will tell them plainly, notice this, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now I want you to notice that word there. I never knew you. The word know in both Hebrew and Greek are both intimate words. They denote an intimate personal relationship. In other words, what Jesus is saying is he was never in a personal relationship with these people and thus he never knew them and thus he commands them to depart from him. And I want you to notice he refers to them as evil doers. Not very politically correct. And so Jesus says, you prophesied in my name? Fine. Drove out demons in my name? Fine. Performed miracles? Fine. Who are you? I don't know you. Depart from me. Away from me, you evil doers. And so the emphasis here is on the knowing. If we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved. But be very careful. Just because someone claims that they perform miracles does not mean they're sent from God. Because scripture points out, false prophets have been able to do this. Now this is exactly we, what we are told by the Apostle Paul. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul is talking about the coming of the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the one who will set himself up against God and against heaven. Notice what he says about Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God. And he goes on to point out here that when he comes, in verse 9 of chapter 2, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. I want you to notice the three words here, miracles, signs, and wonders. But they are all qualified by the adjective counterfeit. In other words, this one who will come, will come in the power of Satan, and he will perform counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. In other words, Antichrist and the Antichrists will be able to perform miracles and signs, but they are really counterfeit. What do I mean by counterfeit? You will remember that when Moses was sent by God to appear before Pharaoh, Moses took with him the rod, the staff. And when Moses appeared before Pharaoh, Moses declared unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. And Pharaoh, of course, responded defiantly, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? Moses took the rod and threw it on the ground. And it became a serpent. The magicians of Egypt came with their rods. And they threw them on the ground, 
And guess what they became? They became serpents. Satan counterfeits the works of God. You see, the devil cannot create anything out of whole cloth. He always mimics, counterfeits, he's a copycat. Are there prophets of God? There are false prophets. Are there teachers that God sends? There's false teachers. Are there true apostles? There are false apostles. Are there true shepherds? There are false shepherds. Are there divine miracles? There are satanic miracles. Are there divine tongues? There are diabolical tongues. Are there divine prophecies? There's diabolical prophecies. Jesus told us about this already in Matthew 7. And so what happened in the case of Moses was that the serpent from Moses' rod swallowed up the serpents that belonged to the magicians of Egypt, indicating that the power of God was by far superior to the power of the magicians who were led by Satan himself. You see, the devil always copies God's miracles, always mimics them. Now in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4, notice the same words are mentioned here, but in this passage, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the signs and wonders that were performed by the apostles, as outlined in the book of Acts. In Hebrews 2 4, it says, God also testified to it, that is their message, by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. Notice the word signs, wonders, and miracles. The same words that Paul used in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. The only difference is Paul qualified them with the adjective counterfeit. Now the Lord Jesus prepared us for all this. None of this should take us by surprise. In fact, when Jesus was approached by his disciples in what is known as the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew 24, we read... As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. At that time, many will turn away from the faith, and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Now I want you to notice here that when the apostles came to Jesus on the Mount of Olives, and they asked him what would be the signs that would indicate that his coming was near, I want you to notice that the first sign Jesus gave was not, watch out for wars, nation will rise against nation, no. He did say that, but that wasn't the first sign. Notice Jesus didn't mention pestilences and famines as the first sign, although he did mention that. Notice he didn't mention earthquakes and all these types of things. The very first sign that he gave us was this. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name. I want you to notice they come in his name. They will use the name of Jesus. They will claim I am the Christ and will deceive many. Many have come throughout history claiming to be the Messiah and have proven to be false. Notice he also says that at that time many will turn from the faith. There will be a great apostasy. They're going to betray, hate each other. Notice he says false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And at that time people are going to claim that Jesus has arrived. People are going to make the claims that Christ has come, he's arrived, and in fact, they're going to say, here he is, he's here, or they're going to say, uh, he's there. Jesus says, don't believe it. False messiahs, false Christs, false prophets will appear. Notice how he says they're going to perform great signs and miracles, just like Paul warned us, just like the book of Revelation warns us, and just like Jesus warned us in Matthew 7. 
he says that these false prophets would perform signs and miracles almost to the extent that they could deceive the elect of God, if it was possible. And Jesus says again, I've told you ahead of time. If anyone says he's out, he is here, he's out in the desert, or he's in here, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. If someone says to you, Jesus has appeared in India, don't believe it. Jesus has appeared in China, don't believe it. Jesus is in Brooklyn through the Watchtower, the Jehovah's Witnesses, he's working through them, don't believe it. Jesus appeared to Joseph Smith in the Mormon Church, don't believe it. Jesus is in Rome, don't believe it. He is here, he's in the inner rooms, he's in the Blessed Sacrament, yes. He is here physically, no, don't believe it. Jesus said that his coming would be like lightning, it would flash from the east to the west and it would be visible, just like the lightning is visible. I want you to notice that the first sign Jesus gives is false prophets and false messiahs. We have seen a plethora of false Christs throughout history. David Koresh claimed to be the Christ. Jim Jones claimed to be the Christ. Even the um, Lubavitch movement among the Jews said that Rabbi Schneerson was the Messiah. As far as I'm concerned, Rabbi Schneerson died and he did not rise the third day. He's still dead. He is not the Messiah. He was not born in Bethlehem. He was born in New York. The Messiah had to come from Bethlehem. He had to die. He had to rise again. He had to suffer a torturous death. He had to be cut off. He had to be judged by a false court. He had to be buried with the rich. None of these things can be fulfilled by anyone else except Yeshua HaMashiach, Baruch Hashem, blessed be His name. So, here in this passage, we are told here, I want you to notice, in this passage of Matthew 24 alone, Jesus warns us four times. I want you to notice, the word deceive appears four times. He says, let no one deceive you. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ. They will deceive many. Many prophets will appear and deceive many people. And that false Christ and false prophets will appear, perform great signs and miracles to deceive. Deceive, deceive, deceive. That's the key word here. He repeats it four times in this passage alone. Now, you have to understand that when Jesus tells us something once, it is important. If he tells us something twice, it is emphatic. It is, we have to pay attention. If he tells us something three times, you really better open up your eyes and see what he's trying to tell you. If he tells you something four times, you need a psychiatrist if you don't know what he's trying to tell you. Four times. Deceive, deceive, deceive. In other words, the one sign that Jesus gave us that would indicate the proximity of his coming would be the multiplicity of false prophets and false teachers on the earth. That is the sign. Not the wars, not the earthquakes, it's the, the emergence of false prophets and false teachers on the earth. And so, in this passage alone, Jesus warns us, beware, false prophets will come. False messiahs will come. They come to you in various forms. You will see them on street corners. They will come to your door on Sunday mornings to keep you from going to church or on Saturdays. And they will say to you, we are members of God's kingdom. We come to proclaim to you Jehovah's kingdom. Or they will tell you, we are members of the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints. We're Christians because we use the name Jesus. Well, you see, you can't be a Christian, Latter-day Saint, former-day Saint, or present-day Saint, if you deny Jesus Christ. And all the cults do that. All cults have five common traits. That is in your handout. Number one, all cults claim that they are the exclusive way to salvation. In other words, you have to be part of a cult. This is under the uh, handout, World of the Cults. You have to be part of a cult in order to be saved. In other words, if you're not part of Jehovah's Witnesses, God will destroy you at Armageddon. There is no truth outside of the Mormon Church. You have to be part of the Mormon Church. You have to be part of 
the Iglesia Ni Cristo, which is a Filipino non-Christian cult that emerged in the Philippines, which is now growing in North America. They claim they are the true Church of Christ, the only Church of Christ, and unless you are part of that church, you are lost. There are all claims that these cults make, but the one claim they make is that they are exclusive to salvation. You must be part of the group to be saved. It's either our way or the highway. And so all cults teach exclusive access to truth and salvation. You must be part of the group. But notice how this differs from Christianity. In Christianity, notice where salvation lies. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want you to notice that salvation in Christianity is not based on a church. It is not based on church attendance. It is not based on denominational lines. It is not based on whether or not you have the blessing of the bishop. It is not based on whether or not you wear a crucifix or whether or not you read your Bible often. Salvation in the New Testament is personal and it is centered on a person, not a church, not an institution, not a group. It is strictly based on a relationship with Jesus. And for that reason, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is one of the most exclusivist claims in the New Testament. By this statement, Jesus has excluded all others. By this statement, Jesus has forever shown that he is the only means to God, that without him, no one can approach the Father. Notice he doesn't say, I am a way, a truth, a life, but the Greek definite article is used, which says, the way, the truth, the life. This is the same thing that the apostles taught. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, this is exactly what the apostles taught. They were consistent. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Notice again, salvation is found in no one else. Not in Muhammad, not in Buddha, not in Confucius. No one but the Lord Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we are saved. In fact, the name Jesus itself comes from the Aramaic Hebrew word Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. In other words, when the angel told Joseph in Matthew 121 to name the child, he says, you shall call him Yeshua, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His very name means Savior. Secondly, all the cults claim that they have extra biblical authority. What I mean by that is the Bible is not the sole source of authority. The Mormon will come to you with a big smile on his face and say, we believe the Bible, but we believe the Book of Mormon is true, and the Bible is inferior to the Book of Mormon. The Christian science people will tell you, we believe in the Bible, but we believe that science and health with key to the scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy supersedes the Bible. You ask the Moonies, they'll say, oh yes, we believe the Bible, but we believe in the divine principle written by Sun Young Moon. You talk to the Jehovah's Witnesses, we believe in the Bible, their translation of the Bible, but they cannot understand the Bible without the literature and the books of the organization. So you see, in the cults, the Bible always holds second place. It is always secondary. It is second fiddle. Do you remember in that movie, Austin Powers, with Mike Myers? Remember Dr. Evil had a partner called Number Two? Number Two, right? Well, the Bible in the cults is Number Two. It's not Number One. And so while the cults will give the Bible lip service, they in fact place it in the secondary level. They don't consider it to be authoritative in the supreme sense. What I mean is, it doesn't judge their books. Their books judge the Bible. That's why the Mormon will read the Book of Mormon and the other books infinitely more than they will the Bible. And they will tell you to your face that the Bible has errors in it and it cannot be trusted. But to the Christian, the Bible is the sole rule of faith and practice. 2 Timothy 3.16 is very clear. All scripture is God-breathed. It is worthy and suitable for teaching, corruption, correction, rebuke, so that the man of God may be totally furnished to do all good works. 
very clear. To the Christian, the Bible is the supreme rule and authority. To the law, to the testimony, Isaiah 20 says, if they do not speak according to this, it is because there is no light in them at all. Number three, they all claim to be the restoration of the truth. All the cults will tell you at one time Christianity went into darkness, that the true faith disappeared from the earth, and God called them to restore the truth. So they will tell you, the Mormon will say, in 1830, God called Joseph Smith to restore the gospel. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you Charles Taze Russell was chosen in 1879 to restore the truth that was lost. Sun Young Moon will tell you that in 1954, Jesus Christ appeared to him and told him to restore the truth that was lost for 2,000 years. All of the cults claim that they are the restoration of the truth. In other words, at one time, the church disappeared and they have restored it. They are the restoration. That's why the Mormons call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, in the Bible, of course, this is simply nonsense. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and in chapter 28, when Peter had confessed Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus said to him, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That was a promise that Jesus made. That Peter... Petros in the Greek, a stone, a little rock, upon whom he would build on this rock. Now in the Greek, you must realize that Catholics take this passage to mean Peter is the first pope. That's not what the Greek says. The word Peter is Petros in the Greek. And Jesus said on this rock, that is the Greek word Petra, is a feminine noun. He's referring to himself. He is saying, Peter, you are the first who can make this confession. You are that first living stone that he would later write about. And upon this rock, the rock of ages, I will build my church. This is the first place in the New Testament that the word church appears. I will build what I will call my church. The Jews had rejected him. And Jesus is now saying, I'm going to create something new. I'm going to create something called the church. And in the church, I will bring together both Jews and Gentiles into one body. The mystery that was, un was hidden will now be realized that the Jew and the Gentile will come together into one body and they will become the servants of God. And Jesus said, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I want you to notice that's a promise. The gates of hell, of Hades, will never overcome his church. And when the Lord Jesus departed from his disciples after giving them the Great Commission, he said to them, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Has the end of the age come yet? No, we're still here. Therefore, the promise holds true. He is still with his church. This is why the church of Jesus Christ could never be destroyed. This is why the Romans could never destroy it. Because as long as Christ is the head of his church, his church will remain invincible. His church will never be destroyed. Because as long as the living head is present among his people, his church will continue to flourish. Number four, they also claim salvation is by works. All of them teach that salvation is by works. This is the unique doctrine of Christianity. All other cults teach you must work for your salvation. All religions teach you must work for your salvation. Christianity is the only faith in the world that teaches salvation by grace through faith alone, without works. You see, the idea of works is man's means to glorify himself. I did it. I did it on my own. I worked my salvation. And God responds in the scriptures, No, you haven't. You've done nothing. You merited eternal damnation. It is I who has worked the work of salvation. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved. Notice the perfect tense there. In the Greek, it's a perfect tense. You have been saved. It's a, it is a completed action. How? Through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. If I give you a gift, you don't have to work for it. It's freely given. Not by works, so that no one can boast. But does works have a place in the Christian life? For, of course. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, notice this, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
In other words, we are saved by grace through faith, not that of ourselves. And God has already ordained that we should do good works. Why? James answers the question so that people can see our faith because faith without works is dead. And finally, and we'll have our break afterwards, finally, the ultimate test, if you want to know whether or not you're dealing with a cult, it's very simple. You ask one question, the very question Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? All the cults will deny the deity of Christ. The Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses is the Archangel Michael. The Jesus of the Mormons is the spirit brother of Lucifer who became the devil. The Jesus of the Unitarians is an exceptionally good teacher. The Jesus of Spiritism is an advanced medium of the 12th sphere. The Jesus of the New Age movement is a guru, an enlightened teacher. The Jesus of Scientology was also an enlightened teacher. But all the cults will deny one thing. All the cults will deny that Jesus Christ is the eternal God himself in human flesh. In other words, the test of Antichrist is the denial of the Lord Jesus. All of them will deny categorically that Jesus Christ is God himself in human flesh, the eternal word. And so when you deal with someone, all you have to do is ask them this question. Is Jesus Christ the eternal God in human flesh? Is he almighty God, second person of the Trinity? And all the cults will say, no.